Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Before we kick things off today, I wanted to give a shout out to the five-star review of the week that I received in iTunes. This one is from Blueprint Doc, who writes, creative, intelligent, and welcoming while providing top tips for health. What a creative podcast. Brody brings on a variety of intelligent guests who are easy and fun to listen to. If you're generally interested in investing and improving your health, this podcast will certainly provide top tips for you. Thank you so much, Blueprint Doc. I wicked appreciate it. There is a sea of podcasts out there in the world and to help people who are in search of the empowering information I try to bring and the spirit that I try to bring it. It's so helpful to have these reviews in iTunes. So if you've been meaning to leave me one, please do it today and I might feature you at the top of a future program. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and today we're going to be talking about two of my most favorite topics on the planet, meditation and neuroscience. My guest today is Dr. Jeff Tarrant, who is the founder and CEO of the Neuro Meditation Institute. He is the author of the book, Meditation Interventions to Rewire the Brain, which is a great book, and his research focuses on exploring brainwave changes that occur as a result of different contemplative practices, energy healing, and energy psychology. He's a regular presenter at national and international conferences and has his private practice right here in Corvallis, Oregon, where I'm based, where he specializes in the use of EEG neuromeditation. Jeff, welcome to today's show. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. We all know, or like most people listening to this show are hip to the idea that meditation is something that we need to have in our lives, right? Like there's all kinds of benefits for literally every system of the body. We know that it can help us change our patterns, that it can bring us out of our heads and into our hearts, that it can, it can even help with things like pain relief and immunity. But there can be a lot of confusion because there are so many different styles of meditation out there and people can run into that, am I doing it right issue. So I was hoping that we could start with the the fact that you make the point in your book that not all meditations are the same and that there are these different styles of meditation that result in different effects on our brains. So I'd love to get into what those different styles are and what effects they have so that we can help people figure out which might be the best practice for them. Sure, yeah. And this is really kind of the meat of the work that we're doing at the Neuro Institute, which is really kind of delving into this understanding that depending on how you use your attention, depending on how the attention is directed and what your intention is, the brain behaves differently. And when you say it that way, it's actually kind of logical and straightforward. You know, obviously, if you use your attention differently and you have a different intention, the brain is going to behave differently. That's we right often, out of Chinese medicine, right? That yi dao, qi dao concept that the attention leads the energy. And so, yeah, what you think about, whether that's your perspective on the world or whether that's directing your qi to your right big toe, it's like that idea of that what we pay attention to leads our, our physiology. Yes, I totally agree. And, you know, th- that idea of what you pay attention to, but how you pay attention, how you're paying attention to it. And so what we have done is basically kind of looked at all of the brain-based literature that's out there that looks at meditation. And there's a lot. There's a lot of, you know, whether it's with fMRIs or EEGs or PET scans or whatever, there's been a mountain of research done looking at the influence of meditation on the brain. And what different researchers have done, there's two articles in particular that are really important. One is by a a couple of guys named Travis and Shear, and the other one is by somebody named Fox. And both of these articles essentially have gathered all of the research articles out there about meditation in the brain, pointing out that practices that emphasize things like a focus or a focused attention, which is what it's usually talked about in the research literature or like a concentration practice. So any of those practices where you are picking a single target, holding your attention on one thing, the mind wanders, and then gently, patiently, non-judgmentally bringing it back to that target. Any practice that emphasizes 
that type of you know mental training, they all do kind of the same thing in the brain. It's actually an activating pattern in the brain. It, it turns on regions in the frontal lobe that are involved in sustaining attention and inhibiting impulses and things like that. And so other practices like the four main styles that we talk about are focus, mindfulness, open heart, and quiet mind. You know, we've kind of described focus briefly. Mindfulness, a lot of people, that's kind of the hot topic now. Everybody's interested in mindfulness. But it's actually important to define that clearly because this is another problem that's happening right now is that because it's become so popular, people are using the term mindfulness to mean a lot of different things. Right. Or even just as, a, as an overarching term for meditation, which it certainly isn't. So how do you make the distinction between mindfulness and, for example, the focus style? Because I could think about like a lot of times in mindfulness trainings, you're encouraged to come back to your breath or, you know, to use something as indeed a, f- a point of focus. So, so tell us the difference there. The way that we're defining mindfulness is really more consistent with kind of uh, actually the way that John Kabat-Zinn, you know, from the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, the way they define it, which is, you know, really this sort of soft attention. It's more moving into an observer stance where you're allowing whatever is most, you know, present in your current state to be there, whether it's a thought or a feeling or a body sensation without judgment, without grasping, without pushing it away. It's a a way of using your attention as a way to allow and let go. To simply just let our experience be what it is without any judgment or commentary, without any grasping or pushing away, to allow just what is to exist without us messing with it. Exactly. And if you think about that kind of way of thinking about it, that's a pretty different way of paying attention than a focus style, directing the attention at one thing and you're holding it there no matter what. And those things that we might be paying attention to could include something like if we're literally like staring at a pine cone or a candle or whether we're focused on a mantra or whether like it could really be anything, right? That where we bring our attention back to that same point. It really could. Yeah, exactly. What what the research seems to suggest is that what the object is, whether it's internal or external, you know, whether it's the breath or a mantra or a pine cone, a lot of the same brain regions are being activated. It's kind of the same process because of how you're using the attention, because the point is just to hold the attention on one thing. You know, you brought up the idea that a lot of mindfulness practices use the idea of focusing on the breath. And so then what's the difference? And we get this question a lot. It's like, well, wait a minute. I thought that was mindfulness. And they certainly interact with each other. And I think that's actually what's happening in a lot of practices is this kind of play between focus and mindfulness. So it's kind of like when you're actually focusing on the target, whatever it is, you're doing a focus practice. But then if you're starting to become aware of what's going on in the environment and, you know, sort of noticing thoughts, noticing bodily sensations, whatever, and then that's kind of what you're doing. Well, now you're shifting into a mindfulness practice. And so you might use the breath as an anchor or whatever, whatever your target is, as an anchor to kind of pull you back on track. You know, for instance, if you get caught up into a thought stream, If you go off into a mindfulness practice, the next thing you know, you're planning, you know, your weekend using the breath as a way to kind of pull yourself back. Yeah, right, right. It's the tether to the present moment. Right. You know, when we talk about these concepts in kind of more advanced classes is really this interplay, kind of what we're talking about of how these different styles can work together. Um, You know, they don't have to exist separate from each other. What we're really pointing out is that, you know, some styles can exist all by themselves. You can just do focus. You can just do mindfulness. You can just do open heart. And a lot of different practices and meditations, in fact, a lot of them that I really enjoy, will blend some of these different styles into one practice. And that's not bad either, but um, we feel like it's important to understand what you're actually doing. Absolutely. Because then you can skillfully employ, you can trade up your practice, change it to allow yourself to enjoy the outcome that you're wanting. Exactly. And that's where things get really, for us, get really interesting is that trying to help people identify, like, why are you meditating in the first place? What is your goal? You know, it could be a spiritual goal, which is why a lot of people get into meditation in the first place or historically. But what we're seeing in our culture right now is that most people are not meditating for spiritual purposes. They're meditating because they want to feel better, you know, because they don't want to be anxious or they want to sleep better or they don't want to be in pain. And it's an interesting place to start, right? Like that I'm hoping that this is like that prove that you're worth it to me (laughs) model of meditation. It's interesting. It's very different than just opening yourself up to the possibility of the gifts that it might have for you. And so I, I find that sometimes the approach 
that we take to something like meditation can almost shift the practice itself. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I would. And I mean, I'm a psychologist. That's my background. You know, a lot of times the way that I am talking about meditation or approaching it for my clients or my students is kind of with that in mind that it's like, you know, we don't really have to approach this initially as a spiritual practice. This can be mental training, which is the way we kind of talk about it, that meditation can be mental training and it, you don't have to believe anything. It's really learning how to have, to be able to direct your attention the way that you need. So it's like a sort of a flexibility of attention to promote health. You know, again, kind of this idea that depending on what your goals and your needs are, you may be directed toward specific kinds of practices. Or, or I would say directed. Certain practices may be more ideal for yeah. what you're trying to accomplish. I'd love to, to unpack that just a little bit more specifically to maybe with a few examples of what people might be needing. So say that you're someone who is very type A, you're very driven, you're very focused in your life. I could be describing myself here, you know, like that someone who is there, you spend a lot of time in your head, you're hard driving and what you need, like to me in Chinese medicine, since we treat with opposites, that it might not be the most balancing thing in the world to be doing a super focused style of meditation. Mm -hmm. It might actually be better to be doing something that either is more heart-centered or that is body-centered or something. What would you prescribe for someone with who's maybe experiencing a bit, they're more tightly wound than they want to be? And so like, yes, they could use some relaxation. They could use a bit more mental ease. Yeah. And actually, I like the way that you kind of framed that, you know, in, in terms of Chinese medicine, because that's kind of the way we think about things as well. But for, from a brainwave perspective, that, you know, if somebody has an over aroused nervous system, and so if they have too much fast brainwave activity, which is often going to be manifest in things like anxiety or worry or, you know, sleep problems or whatever, agitation, for them, we would want something that is a counterbalance. You know, so a quiet mind practice or a mindfulness practice, whereas if somebody has more of a slow brain kind of a uh, disposition, which is often related to things like ADHD or depression, then we would direct them or we would hope that they would start working toward a practice of activating the brain. ADHD is actually a slow brain pattern? It is. That's um, interesting. Yeah, it, it doesn't kind of go with what you would imagine. The main pattern you see with ADHD from a brainwave perspective is too much theta, slow brainwaves, compared to beta, which is a fast brainwave. So the ratio of theta to beta is skewed in favor of the slow waves. An ADHD brain is an under-aroused brain, which, yeah, as you pointed out, seems contradictory. It's like that doesn't make any sense with what I see you know, with people who have ADHD, they right, see you watch the aroused. attention, right. You watch the attention dart around from thing to thing with this trouble focusing, but that's kind of really the key, right? Like that this person needs focus. Right. So yeah. So what's actually going on with, if, if somebody has true ADHD and we, th that's probably beyond, you know, what we're kind of get into today, but somebody with, with what I would consider a true ADHD, well, what's actually happening is there's an under arousal in parts of the brain and so it does not enable those areas of the brain to do their job effectively or efficiently. So the reason they can't pay attention is because the parts of the brain involved in paying attention are under aroused. The reason they can't inhibit themselves is because the parts of their brain that are responsible for that aren't doing their job. And so when you activate it, when you turn it on, it works better. So this is why, even though I'm not a big advocate of you know medications, you know people who have for real ADHD concern, stimulants will often be very helpful. Oh, that is the first time I've really understood that paradox or that seeming paradox. That's really cool to know. Yeah. yeah. This episode is brought to you by my Inner Alchemy Retreat. Hey, what you doing next February? How about you and me and 20 others escape the dark, wet winter and go hang out on a quiet beach in Mexico for a whole week? I'm thinking a world-class retreat center with a five-star restaurant serving us delicious prana-rich meals, Luxury oceanfront bungalows, qigong on the beach. We could do some breathing and moving and some yoga, maybe some snorkeling and surfing, take a long walk at sunset. We'll pulsate between some deep relaxation and deep inquiry work, looking at ourselves through an elemental lens, how wood, fire, earth, metal, and water are at play in our lives, and grounding these concepts in our bodies. You'll emerge feeling renewed with an armload of new self-care tools and a jumpstart on who you're becoming in 2019. 
I've been leading transformational retreats since 2012, and they are powerful in addition to being a total blast. But don't take my word for it. Head over to the Mexico retreat page at brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. And read what past retreat peeps have said. Then sign up. You know you want to, and you deserve it. When you claim your spot by August 1st with the promo code PODCAST, you'll receive a free downloadable copy of my most popular meditations, Advice from Your Future Self, The Healthy Eating Meditation, and The Breathing Bundle. So head to brodywelch.com right now and check it out. And so, and you mentioned, just to backtrack a second, you mentioned that for somebody who is that, that they already have plenty of focus and drive and direction and activating in their lives, like their nervous system is spending a lot of time in a yang state, or, you know, an overstimulated state, that mindfulness and quiet mind could be nice for them. What is quiet mind meditation? So, I mean, these are kind of the naming conventions that we came up with to Mm -hmm. serve as a little bit of an umbrella and to capture certain things. And so the types of practices that fit under quiet mind are things like TM, transcendental meditation, and a lot of Zen meditation practices. And so when you look at what's happening in the brain in both of those practices, it's actually an increase of a slow brain wave called alpha. Alpha is kind of in the middle, but this is actually like the slowest part of alpha. So it's eight to 10 hertz is what increases during those meditative states. And when you have a lot of eight to 10 hertz going on in your brain, it's pretty quiet. There's just not much going on. And what's actually more important is where this is happening in the brain. And so it's actually happening in a region of the brain or a a set of areas in the brain called the default mode network. And the default mode network's job is to think about itself. So they talk about self-referencing or self-processing, or sometimes in Buddhist literature, they'll talk about selfing. So literally creating your self-identity. And Spending too much time in your story and depression, right? Like that's often like where people, like where that advice, like go get outside yourself, like go volunteer or go, you know, connect right. with another human being can, can be the same advice. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And so, you know, with anxiety, with depression, with a lot of things, part of the problem is that the person can't get out of their own head and they're thinking about themselves or ruminating about themselves, comparing themselves to others, judging themselves. All of that stuff involves the default mode network being overactivated. And so if we can quiet that system down, it can help with a whole bunch of things. So the quiet mind practices, that's really what they're devoted to. It's it's, can you learn to shut that system down and just allow for internal quietude. Um, And so, you know, there's various tips and strategies and tools and things like that that we use to try to help people to find that state and cultivate it. Do you have a favorite tip that you could share right now? Yeah. So for a quiet mind practice, what we've found is that for most people, the easiest way to get into that space is to direct the attention toward the absence of things. It it sounds crazy, but it's like, what are you paying attention to? It's like, well, you're paying attention to nothing. But literally, if you direct your attention toward space, toward distance, toward volume, in any kind of a way. So whether you're imagining floating in space and the distance between the stars or staring up at a big blue sky where there's nothing for the mind to really grasp onto, looking at trees, but paying attention to the negative space, looking at where there isn't, there aren't any branches and kind of allowing your consciousness to move into that space. When the mind pays attention to the absence of something, it gets really quiet. That reminds me of um, the not this, not this, or nyeti, nyeti practice from Tantra, where basically it's just like, nope, you're not this. Nope, you're not this either. <laughs> so you, keep, you keep letting go with any label that you're trying to, to put on yourself or, or on the experience. Just get oh. deep. It's a, and it's a bliss practice. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it sounds like there's some similarities. You know, in this case, I mean, another way that we talk about it is, is literally, you know, directing your attention. So if I'm guiding a meditation, I might sort of provide the suggestion of sort of focusing on sort of a, a space inside the head and allowing that space to become filled with blackness, darkness, you know, not, not in a negative way, but just as a, there's nothing there. And can you sort of allow that to expand so that, you know, kind of internally, there's just this sort of like empty space. Mm, um, I, and then you just get to dissolve into all that is. Like you get to not have, <laughs> there, there gets to not be content to who you are anymore, which is beautiful. Exactly. Now, I should say a big emphasis that we have here now, you know, we're psychologists. So, you know, these, these are things that are important to us is, is sort of, you know, we talk about using these practices in, in sort of a trauma-informed way. And what we mean by that is that 
being thoughtful about how people that have any kind of trauma history or, or history of difficult experiences, that sometimes meditation can be very challenging because if you allow the mind to get quiet, sometimes some of that stuff from the past will creep up and it can be disturbing. It can be unexpected. And so not just quiet mind, but a lot of meditations can actually be triggering for people. Well, right. And that's part of why it can be so potent to for healing is like we're, we're allowing there to be space for something to come up, even if it's just something that we don't realize is bothering us. It could be little or, or it could be huge. But I think that's a really important caveat that you're mentioning here is it can bring up your shit and like you might <laughs> really well need some help with that. Right. And so what, what we try to do with that is a, you know, kind of let people know that that's a possibility because sometimes people enter into meditation and they're just expecting to sort of be blissed out and happy and joyful. And certainly that happens sometimes, but sometimes it's just plain old work and sometimes it's very difficult. And so, you know, if you're coming into this with a realistic expectation and understanding, you know, I think you're going to be much more successful. And then also, you know, kind of the idea again, like a kind of the Buddhist idea of like, you know, skillful action, you know, helping people to understand that it's like, if you get into a situation with meditation and it's extraordinarily unpleasant and uncomfortable, you know, sometimes the smartest thing to do is get out of it. If you can work with it, fantastic. But sometimes that's not the right thing to do. It's not the right time. And so developing skills with grounding, developing the flexibility of being able to shift. And then, you know, you can use meditation as a tool, like you were talking about, you know, to kind of help you kind of work with these things and be with, you know, some of the experiences in the past and not be overwhelmed by them. You and I both teach Qigong, and I'm wondering where you would put that in the four styles of meditation and what you feel like its biggest strengths are. That's a good question. I'm laughing because it's like, that's a tricky one. I feel like Qigong actually incorporates all of them. Um, and of course, there's, you know, who knows, thousands of styles of Qigong. Right. It's not one thing. As many different kinds of religions as there are, or as many different kinds of philosophies, it's like, it's definitely not all one thing. Exactly. And for me, it goes back to the idea again of it's like, you know, how are you directing your attention and what is your intention? And so I think Qigong can actually be any and all of these, depending on those two things. As an example, doing like a microcosmic orbit type meditation to a large degree, I think that can really serve as a focus practice because you're using these different anchors, whether it's, you know, different acupoints, uh, you know, along the governing and central meridians and they're following that and sort of, you know, circulating the energy and kind of tuning into that process. That's what you're using to kind of hold your attention, you know, on sort of one thing. So you could use it as a focus practice. You know, you could certainly use a lot of this is a mindfulness practice where you're noticing what's coming up, you know, you're noticing what's happening in the body. Are you grounded and rooted? What's going on in the feet? What's going on with the breathing? What's going on with your tailbone? <laughs> what's going on with your shoulders? Noticing all of these things moment to moment to moment along with what's going on internally with your thoughts and emotions. So then it becomes more of a mindfulness practice. So again, I think it just depends on how you're sort of directing the attention. That makes a lot of sense to me because I agree that like certain kinds of inner gazing practices in Qigong, like the microcosmic orbit that you're referencing, uh, when, for those listeners, it's essentially that's just it's directing qi with your mind around along particular channels. In this case, the do and the run or the conception and governor vessels, which run up the front and down the back and et cetera in the body. And yeah, that we can get better at that because our energy follows our focus, we can get better at opening our own channels and breathing energy along a pathway. Like for patients with pain, it's a lot of times I'll just encourage them to stretch, but bring your mind into it. Or imagine I'll show them where the meridian is and encourage there to be some breath through that channel to open it up. And that that's a way of directing the body's attention, but it, it's essentially mental manipulation. It, it's certainly not just letting the, the mind be the observer and just getting curious about what's right. going on in different places of the body. It's very different. And so if you're right. wanting to be more like your own healer, you could have a more focused focused Qigong practice, focused meditation style Qigong versus a body awareness, just figure out like, wow, yeah, I never, like, just what does it feel like if if I'm moving like this in my lower back? What is it feeling like in my shoulders to breathe into them this way? What you know, th These ideas of curiosity and being really putting your awareness in your body as opposed to like having it reside between our ears. 
And so, and the work that you do, like, so I, I've been to your office and I, I've seen this crazy gadget that you put on people's heads and measure their brain waves. And I think that's super cool. And I should probably come back and do that with you at some point. But I'm curious if I, I know there's more and more technologies out there to help people figure out if they're doing it right or not. Like I know there's the heart math has an app and there's something called mm-hmm. Muse that can give you yep. real time feedback about what's going on. Are there technologies or biohacking devices that you recommend? Men's for people that they could be doing at home to engage with their brains and, and get that real-time feedback about whether they're doing it right? The ones you mentioned are both, you know, I'm a big fan of heart math and the heart rate variability monitoring. And they have, you know, as you mentioned, like a phone app where you can just plug a sensor into your phone and use it right like that, or they have a desktop application. And it's very easy to use. It actually, we use it a lot. We actually have a, a we've created a lab where we can, you know, do about 12 people in a group with the heart rate variability. And one of the things that we've discovered is that you can actually use that as a very direct tool to teach focus, mindfulness, and open heart practices, all three of them. Now, it's a little bit trickier with quiet mind, but you can use that very simple biofeedback tool for a lot of different practices. I also like the Spire. It's a little biofeedback device. You kind of wear it on your belt and it's measuring uh, your breathing and it's Bluetooth to your phone. And it's giving you a ton of information about your breath. And so again, you can use that as a biofeedback tool as well. And as a meditation tool, the Muse headband, it's picking up EEG brainwave signals from two channels right on your forehead and then kind of two right behind your ears. You know, it's also Bluetooth to your phone. That one is a little bit, some people really like it and they find it as a useful tool to learn how to do some basic meditation practices. Um, But I've also talked to a lot of people, and I'm one of them, where the feedback that I get back from that doesn't really match my internal experience. It's a little bit tricky because it's only measuring a particular thing. And so it doesn't allow much individual variability in terms of what you're doing in your meditation. And that seems kind of counterproductive if part of this is about just being comfortable with our own experience and with who we are. What we're doing in our offices, it's kind of like the Muse headband except on steroids. You know, it's way more (laughs) sophisticated. We can measure 19 channels of the brain, deeper brain structures, so that we can actually provide really direct information about what any brain region that we're interested in, what it's up to, and with all of the brain waves, so that we can actually create protocols for each of the styles, so that we can, you know, really kind of help people figure out what it feels like to be where they're trying to go. Now, that's not a very user-friendly thing for most people because it requires some fairly sophisticated equipment that's not, you know, quite as easy. So, in that regard, the Muse headband is, you know, it's good for what it is. It's a relatively simple, straightforward tool that, um, you know, is useful, I think, for some people, especially if they're just beginning. One of these days, I really would love to stop by and try out some of the stuff that you've got going on. I think you would enjoy it. We're sort of working with really deeper states of consciousness, you know, how to kind of help people get there. And that's, it's been a lot of fun. Roughly, we've been calling it deep states. It's deep states. Like the, okay, yeah, great. Kind of like the, like the fifth style. Nice. Um, But within the deep states, there's several different things going on. It's not just like one thing. Right. Okay. Which makes it a little bit confusing because it's kind of like, well, you know, which deep states are we talking about? But one of the protocols that we've been playing with is, and I'm still kind of trying to come up with a good name for this one too, but right now I'm calling it the altered states protocol. And basically what we did was we took all of the research on psychedelic medicine and what's going on with psychedelics in the brain and then mimicked that with the neurofeedback protocol. So we're trying to use the neurofeedback as a way to guide people into these very disinhibited internal states where stuff just comes up, stuff just happens. You have experiences, you know, and that's been very interesting, very fun, sort of leading people into those spaces. How long does that usually take? Actually, not that long because most people can only do it for about 25 minutes and then the ego kicks in. Uh, Really what I think we're doing is we're kind of teaching the ego to get the heck out of the way. And most people can do that for a little while, but then after about 20 or 25 minutes, the ego really kicks in hard. Interesting. Um, And you can see it in the brain waves. You know, you see because of where we're measuring. So the ego is kind of, okay, we're done with, you know, like you're messed with stuff. It's my territory. And then you're kind of done for that day. I feel like it's actually a, um, it's a really excellent training tool to teach people how to start to let go of their ego control and have a little bit of 
you know, be able to manipulate that a little bit without it just being, you know, having to use necessarily heavy doses of plant medicine or something, which is fine. But, you know, can you learn to kind of do that on your own and sort of move in and out of those interesting states? We're still kind of developing this, but so far what we have is pretty is pretty fun. But so there's a lot of fun things that you can do with that. And that's what we're still exploring. There's actually some deep work, you know, just like with psychedelic medicines, people can do really deep work in terms of, you know, they're, they're showing that it, it can be very useful for depression and anxiety and obsession of compulsive disorder and addictions and PTSD. Yeah. And we're starting to explore that. It's like, well, how could we use this as a really a treatment tool to help people kind of go into these places, but then come out with a different view of themselves and a different view of their symptoms. And so that, you know, it doesn't have the same power that it had in the first place. That seems like really valuable and really fascinating work. Great. Well, I appreciate getting you to weigh in on those things because I'm certainly curious about all that. If people are interested in learning more or maybe taking one of your trainings or working with you, where can they find you? Pretty much everything that we do is on our website, which is uh, www.neuromeditationinstitute.com. That's all one big word. And we offer six-week classes for each style. So we just finished the focus class and we'll be beginning the mindfulness class in beginning of April, April 4th, I think. That doesn't require any equipment or anything like that. We're just teaching the skills and practices and the science behind you know mindfulness. And they also have one day, two day and three day workshops that we offer for mostly for professionals, mental health professionals and people in any kind of helping profession. And those happen periodically. So those are on the website. And then we also have monthly sound meditations. That's a lot of fun. Gongs and crystal bowls and whatnot. We have a drop-in meditation every Monday at around the noon hour, just anybody that wants to come join us. And then, you know, working with people individually, they would just need to get in touch with me if they wanted to do some of the EEG neuro meditation. You know, that those are just individually scheduled appointments. Awesome. Dr. Jeff Tarrant, thank you so much for sharing all that you know about, or not that you shared all that you know, but sharing so much of what is super useful for us in figuring out what can be a really complicated and confusing field. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to BrodyWelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.